nowadays, anyone who's taken ill in the Netherlands, or in any other developed country for that matter, can count on receiving good medical care. We can hardly imagine that in days past, things were completely different. But the history of medicine goes back thousands of years, starting far before the Christian era and reaching a milestone with the works of Hippocrates and Garland. Doctors today are still required to take the Hippocratic Oath, which specifies their responsibilities and sets out guidelines for their conduct. The writings of Garland have influenced medical thinking for the past 1,500 years. And yet, for many hundreds of years, doctors had no proper understanding of human anatomy. The circulation of blood, for instance, was only discovered in the 17th century. Nowadays, surgeons operate with the assistance of an endoscope. Ages, Europe was haunted by epidemics of which there was no known cure. Leprosy, for instance, was a highly common disease. Lepers led a wandering existence relying on charity for their food. For fear of infection, they were not allowed within the town walls and were obliged to announce their arrival by sounding a rattle or beating a drum. Plague and cholera were the most widely feared diseases. The plague epidemic of 1348, the Black Death, decimated the population of Europe. As late as the 17th century, nearly 40,000 people fell victim to these diseases in Leiden and Amsterdam. Plague houses, where the sick were given some rudimentary care, were built outside the walls of the larger towns. These hospices, as they are known, were the first hospitals. In the early Middle Ages, monasteries played an important role in healthcare. Most monasteries had a special ward known as the infirmary. The monks grew medicinal herbs in their gardens and they gained a thorough knowledge of natural medicines. Their remedies were set down in herbals, complete with fine illustrations. The monks, though, did not perform surgery. Understanding of the workings of the human body, which was based on Greek and Arab sources, was still very elementary. But this changed with the work of Andreas Vesalius. I would no longer be willing to exhume bones from the Paris cemeteries for my studies, nor would I go beyond the town walls of Louvain to take corpses from the gallows for their skeletons. But I thought little of doing such things in my youth, when I was not yet ripe enough to earn money from my art and when I was driven by my unbridled curiosity. He had to obtain the materials he needed for his studies by highly devious means. The dissection of the human body was forbidden by both church and government. Because war had broken out, I returned to Louvain. While out walking with my friend Gemma Frisius, I stumbled across a dried out corpse, much to the pleasure of my students, near the country road where the bodies of executed criminals were left to rot. I suspect that the birds had deprived it of its flesh, like the thief Garland speaks of. In the 16th century, Andreas Vesalius's writings, which were based on his own observations, greatly enhanced his contemporaries' knowledge of anatomy. 
With the publication of his famous work, De Humani Corporis Fabrica, in 1543, Vesalius revolutionized thinking on anatomy. For the first time, details of the human body were shown in 70 wonderful illustrations. Since then, true-to-life diagrams and sketches have become an integral part of medical manuals. As Leonardo da Vinci said, you who think you can reveal the human form in words have got it wrong. For the more accurate the description, the more you will confuse the reader. You must both illustrate and describe. Knowledge of anatomy grew rapidly, thanks to Vesalius and his followers but the average patient was not much better off. University-educated physicians left the rough manual work to traveling practitioners and quacks who could be consulted at, for instance, the annual fairs. People could also turn to the barber surgeon, who performed both minor and major operations in his shop. Barber surgeons hung basins near their shop doors to indicate that they could be consulted. Since they could only make a very poor living with these operations, they usually worked as barbers on the side. <laughs> to show how skilled they were, some of these barber surgeons decorated their shops with exotic animals and objects. As a result, the trade was shrouded in mysticism. It was not easy to become a surgeon. After many years of study with an established master, apprentices had to take an examination before the masters of the local guild of surgeons. One of the elements of this examination was the testing of the lancets, which the apprentice had to make and grind himself. They had to be sharp enough to cut through leather. Once he'd passed his examinations, the new master was allowed to practice, provided he became a member of the guild. He could now treat his own patients. Apprentices could also take the C-test, an easier examination to which a shorter period of apprenticeship applied. The qualification was only valid on board a warship or merchant vessel. The crew were recruited from the dregs of society, and their health was already poor when they signed on. They slept in ice-cold berths between decks, where the sick were also treated. This increased the risk of infection and lowered resistance to disease. Poor diet led to scurvy, and sometimes only half of the crew survived the voyage. In times of war, there were even fewer survivors. Ship's surgeons had to take prompt and drastic action during naval battles if the wounded seamen were to survive. And there were no anesthetics. Yet it was on board ship and on the battlefield that surgeons gained a broad practical experience.
surgical instruments often had a highly complex design and were decorated with carvings. This made them difficult to clean and gave rise to infection. Cornelis Solingen, who served as a surgeon on board the ships of the admirals de Reuter and Tromp, designed surgical instruments with smooth surfaces. They closely resemble the instruments now used by our surgeons. In the 17th century, when the ships of both the East and West India companies sailed the oceans of the world, and Holland developed into the world's foremost trading nation, Dutch medical knowledge also became world-renowned. Leiden University attracted students from all over Europe. The anatomy theatre, where the sections were performed for both students and other interested parties, was modelled on the theatre in Padua. It accommodated more than 100 persons. Illustrissimi domini. Although by then better books and illustrations had become available, it was important for students to test their knowledge against their observations. To that end, the university was given the corpses of executed criminals. The dissections often took several days and had to be carried out rapidly before decomposition set in. Such dissections were important occasions and they were attended by both the students and their professors. Teaching was temporarily suspended. Artists sometimes attended these dissections. Rembrandt recorded one such session in his famous painting, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicolas Tulp. Sections were also taken to give the future physician a good idea of the interior of the human body. Confidence gradually grew in physicians as experts on the human body, despite the fact that they did not always have the right remedies at their disposal. Purging and bleeding were still common methods of treatment. Covert Bidlow had a better idea of human anatomy when, in 1685, he published a new atlas with pictures by Gerard de Lares. Jan Vondelaar was responsible for the famous drawings in Bernard Siegfried Almanus's anatomical atlas. He used a framework and viewfinder to produce accurate representations of the proportions. Under the supervision of Albinus, Vondelaar produced pictures of the perfect man, which he placed against special backgrounds. To many, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek is still a famous name. He was a passionate explorer of the microscopic world. Using self-made microscopes, van Leeuwenhoek discovered many things which had hitherto been hidden from view. He was the first to discover bacteria and to report to the Royal Society in London, of which he was a member. This small microscope is one of the unique instruments with which Van Leeuwenhoek performed 50 years of research. The microscope revealed a new, hitherto unknown world and became one of the most important research instruments. A large collection of these microscopes is on view in the Boerhaave Museum in Leiden. Here, the history of science and medicine comes to life. The museum is housed in the former Cecilia Hospice, where Hermann Boerhaave, one of Holland's greatest scholars, once lectured. The anatomy theater was also located here. Het museum waar we nu zijn was vroeger een ziekenhuis en het is genoemd naar Herman Boerhaven. Die leefde van 1668 tot 1738. Herman Boerhaven lived from 1668 to 1738. He was not only a physician, but also a chemist and a botanist. 
In 1709, he became professor of medicine and botany. There is a story that he a brief from China, where he was told Dr. Boerhaave, Europa. And toch seems that brief has come to be. Antimoni, the actor. Boerhaave became world-renowned thanks to his qualities as a teacher. One of his students, Albrecht von Haller, later said that Boerhaave could be regarded as Europe's leading medical expert. Many of his students went on to make their own mark on the history of medical science. Boerhaave was not only a professor, he also had his own highly successful practice, and many famous people sought his advice. As the story goes, even Tsar Peter the Great, while in Holland, had to visit Boerhaave at six o'clock in the morning, as this was the only time the great scholar was free. <laughs> but Boerhaave remained a modest, loyal, friendly person. His motto, simplex sigillum veri, simplicity is the mark of truth, says it all. Modern medical science is partly based on discoveries made in the 19th and 20th centuries. Nowadays, patients are surrounded by a wide range of high-tech equipment, but this patient is probably unaware that the plaster cast was first used by Antonius Matthijsen, a Dutch army doctor. When, in the late 19th century, Willem Conrad Röntgen discovered the X-ray, doctors were presented with previously undreamed of opportunities to diagnose the causes of illness. Röntgen spent his youth in Apeldoorn, graduated from the College of Technology in Utrecht, and went on to complete his studies in Zurich. Röntgen became the first Nobel Prize winner for physics. The 19th century was a century of inspiration when the great scientific discoveries were made. Many of our modern achievements are the direct or indirect results of 19th century discoveries. This also applies to a considerable extent to the developments in the field of medicine and medical technology. The future is in focus. The Dutch have made major contributions in the specialist fields of ophthalmology and cardiology. If in the past people needed glasses, they simply went to a shop and tried on different pairs until they found the ones they needed. Thanks to the work of Franciscus Cornelis Donders, eyes can now be tested properly and the right glasses fitted. Donders was one of the founders of the Eye Hospital, where ophthalmologists could receive their training. Up to that time, eye specialists had been unknown. The first electrocardiograph was designed by Willem Eindhoven. In order to be able to trace the weakest of heartbeats, Eindhoven designed an extremely sensitive galvanometer complete with recording equipment. This instrument comprised optical, electrical and mechanical components with the most up-to-date technology. Eindhoven's 30 years of work were rewarded with a Nobel Prize. Nowadays, coronary care equipment is standard in every hospital, and this also applies to Jakob Jongblud's heart-lung machine. This prototype is indeed a real machine, just like the artificial kidney, which was developed by Willem Johann Kolff. Kidney transplants were unknown in 1944. Kolff later broke new ground by developing an artificial heart. Yeah. <laughs> 
Life is the sum of phenomena that counteract death, said the French anatomist Bichat in the 18th century. The thousands of scientists who have brought medicine up to its present level will most certainly hardly agree with Bichat. But there are still many problems to be solved. Mankind is still faced with many illnesses, while new diseases have now presented themselves. Innumerable questions remain as yet unanswered. Research must continue using the most advanced technologies. New cures need to be developed, and there might even be new areas of medicine to explore. Life itself is a more complex matter than our ancestors thought, but this work is worthwhile, that is beyond doubt. For, as Descartes said, we need not become the lords and masters of nature to invent the technology, to reap all the fruits of the earth, and to enjoy every comfort this world can offer. We merely need the means to preserve our health. For this is no doubt the most important boon of all. It is at the root of all other happiness life can offer us.